Welcome back to the North Carolina State Council's Virtual Council. Again, this is our November session, and so far we have had amazing programming, starting with our prayer clinic, followed by our Bible class, and our missionaries and Christian women's auxiliary did a fine, fine job during their programming as well. And so now without further ado, we're gonna get ready to start an open panel discussion today that will be moderated by our very own Pastor Gwendolyn Brown Felder. She will moderate this session entitled, The Power of Relationships. And we have our featured panelists today, Pastor Terrence Trapp, from Synergy Temple in Charleston, South Carolina, and Dr. Connie Green from Prayer and Deliverance Tabernacle in Charlotte, North Carolina. And so I'm so, so excited about this panel because we have some very, very capable presenters as well as a very, very capable moderator. But before we get started, again, I want you to share because sharing is caring. Let's make this content go viral. And if you're on YouTube, I want you to comment and share the link as well. We invite you to just engage in this conference because although it's virtual, we're not in person, we can't necessarily see each other face to face, that doesn't mean we can't engage and interact with each other. And so this is a panel discussion and so you can feel free to discuss in the comments uh, how you feel about each and every topic as we talk about the power of relationships. I'll leave it to each presenter and panelist to give you their subtopics to the panel discussion so that you'll get a greater understanding for which topics we want to discuss throughout this panel but I want you to stick with us until the end because there are some there's some important information that I believe you'll gain through this session as well as you'll find out ways to be a supporter and to give to the North Carolina State Council and so I'll be back with you shortly but until then let's go into our cyber sanctuary as our moderator Pastor Gwen Brown Felder will lead us throughout this session. Welcome to the 58th Episcopal District of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World Incorporated, November Council 2021. Praise the Lord, praise the Lord, everybody. I am your moderator, Pastor Dr. Gwendolyn Hill Brown Felder of Truth and Love Ministry Fellowship, Nashville, Tennessee, the moderator for this distinguished panel entitled The Power of Relationships. Please help me welcome these absolutely positively excellent presenters. Our first presenter, we have two absolutely positively excellent presenter. Our first presenter is the illustrious Dr. Connie Green, assistant pastor of the prayer and deliverance ministry worldwide of Charlotte, North Carolina. She is an evangelist. She is a motivational speaker. She is author of several books. She is a loving mother and grandmother. She is married to Suffolk and Bishop Roger Green Sr. and the mother of our eloquent host, Minister Roger Green Jr. I present to you Dr. Connie Green. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining me today. I'm so excited to be a part of this panelist. I want to thank our Bishop Marion E. Wright Sr. for having the opportunity to share with you today, as well as Suffolk Bishop Maxie Dobson, our chairman, and his wonderful staff, as well as Pastor Gwen Brown Feller, as well as the mod one of the moderators or panelists, Pastor Terrence Trapp. So excited to be again, again to be here with you today, and I'm gonna get right into the topic of my discussion, which is gonna be talking about the power of relationships and friendship, sticking closer than a brother. It is so important for us as leaders, since this is a leadership conference, to be a, a friend, to be a confidant, to be someone that can support one another I think this is a very great topic. It really blessed me as I was studying it because sometimes we think we're on, on an island all by ourselves. And we sometimes we do things by ourselves and we feel like we don't need anybody else. But in order to be a great leader, we must have leaders and we must have friends and acquaintances and people that can help us get to the next level. So let's jump right on in here. Okay, right here, the name of my topic is going to be the power of relationships. I want to talk about the power because without 
one or two or three others that are helping you or even a group of people could be hundreds helping you, you will never get to your greatest potential without having somebody to help you get to the next level. So it's power in that. It's power, you know, I think about in the scripture when it said they was all in one accord in one place. And that's when the Holy Ghost came because God knew that we needed each other. So he expects for us to have powerful relationships with one another. And it's very, very important to have friends, develop friends and those that you can trust and those that can help you get to the next level. And even those when you're discouraged and you just need somebody to encourage you. So let's just jump right on into it as I was just saying. Okay, let's stop and think about this. When we talk about friendship, there are very levels, various levels of, of friendship. You know, there's a lower level of friendship and those are the people that we may know or people that we're acquainted with uh, on, and we know them on a regular basis and maybe we work with them and maybe in an auxiliary or, or even on your job, but they have no sense of obligation or desire to walk with us in difficult times. And so that's one of the lower level friendships or acquaintances that we, that we have in our lives. Then uh, we look at the high degree of, of, of friendships those are the people that have a high degree of loyalty, you know, because they uh, care about you and, you know, they care how you're going to be able to uh, push through when you're discouraged or you, or you feel like you can't do something. These are the people that are encourage you and keep you going. And then there's others that don't have a high degree of, 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 uh, uh, of loyalty because they're interested in themselves and you'll know that can it's the one you know when you tell them something about something great God has done for you and they don't celebrate you they look at you strange and walk away and they have a little Kirk on the, uh, a little attitude on their face or whatever because they feel like that you're bragging but basically you just wanted somebody to encourage you so you you can kind of tell when you got those kind of friends and those are the ones you don't want to be around when we look in the Bible, it was a, a man that Paul was talking about. His name was Dunamis. And he said that he had left him because he loved the world. He said, he deserted me. And this was in the book of 2 Timothy chapter 4 and 10. He said, because he loved the world, Paul said, he deserted me. And then we look also in the scripture where it talks about what Jesus talks about. He speaks about a level of friendship that goes even greater than that. Yeah, it's in, um, in the book of Luke. Uh, uh, verse 12, it says, this is my commandment that you love one another, even as I have loved you. Greater love has no man than this, that he laid down his life for his friends. And he, he, he goes on to let us know that if anybody laid down their life for you, and most of our friends want to do that, but Jesus did that for us. He laid down his life for us. And he, you know, and he became our friends because he gave his life for us. We were first friends, but then he began to tell the disciples, he said, you're no longer would be called my friends or my servants. He said, you will be called, uh, let me go back to that. He says, no longer do I call you servants for a servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends for all the things I have heard from my father. I have made known to you. So he tells, tells, he was talking to his disciples and giving them a little secret in, into his life and what he was getting ready to teach them and develop into them to let them know that you're much greater than a servant, but now you're my friend. And he called us his friend. And I, you know, and that made that you had a greater relationship with him because now you were so close to him. He decided to make them a friend. And that's just how much he felt for them. And he was basically telling us that, you know, a fr I'm your friend, but I'm going to lay down my life for you. That's how much I love you. And that's how much I'm going to be here for you. And so then there's another scripture in um, Proverbs. It talks about deep friendships also. He says, there is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Let me say that again. There is a friend that sticketh closer than a brother. You ever had those kind of friends where, you know, they're your friends and then all of a sudden now you call them, that's my sister, that's my brother from another mother. 
That's the type of friendship I'm talking about. That's the type of friendship that Proverbs was talking about. Proverbs chapter 18, 24. He said, there is friendships that stick closer than a brother. I have some friends like that. I know you have some friends like that. That You started out being friends, but they you began, began to be yoked with that friendship. And they became like they were family to you. And so you can go to them anytime you needed something. If you were discouraged, you can go to them. You can talk to them. You know, that's the kind of friendship that we need in order to develop relationships and get us to the next level. Those are the type of the friendships that you can trust, to have loyalty, that'll be there for you. And not just to be there because they want something from you, but they're truly serious about you and having that relationship. The Apostle, the Apostle John describes a kind of uh, friendship that Christ this. Uh, this demonstrated towards all of us. He says, no one shows greater love than when he lays down his life for his friends. He lays down his life for his friends. And that's in John chapter 15 and 13. And then Paul says, he had a deep, he had a deep relationship for, for his friends also. In other words, he had them in several cities all over the country. He has some friends that he opened up his home to. You ever had a friend that called you and he said, I'm in your area. Can I come by and, and, and I spend the night with you? And if you if that's your friend that stick is closer than a brother, you're going to open up your doors. But Paul had those type of friends. He had friends that prayed for him diligently. Do you have those kind of friends that just pray for you diligently, really pray? They don't say they're going to pray and then go somewhere and don't pray. But it, they, sometimes they'll stop right there and say, let's pray. I see that you're going through something. Let's pray. Those are some great friends. Then there are some friends uh, that, uh, that Paul was talking about. He had some friends that worked with him in ministry. And then he had few friends that even went to jail with him. Wow. Now, that's a friend right there that would even go to jail with you. You know, and so Paul had those kind of friends. And Paul was so grateful to God for those type of friends that, that he had. And we should be grateful to God as well. When we have friends like that, we shouldn't be, um, you know, take them for granted and, and, and feel like, well, you know, so what? You're just a friend and I got many friends and you just move on. No, you need to stop and really think about what God has put in your life. Friends that you can really depend on. A lot of people don't have friends. Some people just stay by themselves and they're angry and they're bitter and they're upset and they don't trust anyone. And I understand that because people, you know, can uh, um, do things in your life and, and, and discourage you and and betray you and now you don't want any friends and then you just close up and you build up those walls and you no, wanna, no longer want to develop any friendships. But I want to tell you today, I want to encourage you and tell you, don't stop there because where God has closed the door in one area of your life with someone, then he has another door open up for many more friends that he wants you to meet. So just move on, move forward, get over the hurt, Get over the, the betrayal and move on because God's got somebody great and better for you. Better than that other friend was. You know, even in, in you know, when Jesus, you know, you know, he was God himself. Judas betrayed him and he moved forward. But he, you know, it was all part of the plan for God to get to the next level. So look at it that way. Sometimes God will bring friends in of our lives to get us to the next level, to close the door on that relationship because perhaps that relationship was stagnant and was 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 really stopping you from getting to the next level and destroying your life because you was following somebody that wasn't, was, wasn't even supposed to be in a part of your life because it, they made you go to the another level in your life because you was trying to please them. So when that person is out of your life, then God can really speak to you because that person perhaps had a, a strong uh, influence in your life, and but you was moving in the wrong direction. So sometimes God would just shut those doors in your life and get some new people in your life to get you to that next level. All right. It was the love of such friends that brought him such joy and comfort. Talking about Paul, he was so excited. So I want you to be excited about the ones that's in your life that God has brought in your life. And it's another story in the book of Acts where Paul was about to be in danger. In other words, he was about to be, be killed. And he, he had some friends that stepped in and took control of the situation and saved him from danger. The account of that story is in the book of Acts chapter 19. It was a huge demonstration against Christians that took place in a theater and Paul had heard that his some of his his friends were in there 
and they was rioting and they was dragging some of the Christians into the theater and they was stoning them, killing them and beating them and stuff. And so he was concerned. So Paul was getting ready to go in there and, and in there with the with the angry rioters and that was in the street dragging his, uh, some of his uh, companions in there and he was getting ready to go in there and fight or take care of them or try to pull them out. I don't know what he was doing, but he knew they were his friends and he wanted to do the very best he could. And so Paul stopped because he had good friends that heard that he was getting ready to come and go inside the theater and they knew he would probably be killed. And they talked to him and they, 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 they persuaded him not to go in there into the theater. So when you look at the word that translated where the Bible says, he said, and, and that Paul would have went into that. When you look at that word would, it simply means that they advised him not to go in there. They canceled him and he listened to them. And because of that, he was not killed. He was able to move forward and continue to do the work of the Lord. Today, I want you to think about the times when God used family, friends, and acquaintances to save you from a mistake that you was about to make. Think about that. Think about that. And give, just stop right now and give God praise in that moment. I praise him right now. I don't know about you. It's been times in my life that I was so mad about something. I was going to do something crazy. And I called a friend and I told them what I was getting ready to do. And they said, no, you're not. You're not going to do that. You're not going to call them. They're not going to bless them out. You're not going to put nothing on Facebook. You're not going to scandalize their names. You're not going to do any of that because you're better than that. You're greater than that. Aren't you excited about friends like that, acquaintances and family members that that pull you back and get your mind together and get your mind all straight because you were getting ready to do something. Well, you know, they did that because they love you and they knew that you were better than that. So th let's thank God right now for people, friends, and acquaintances that we have that's, that's, that does that for us, that help us. Those are the people that really, really love you. And so I just, I'm so excited about that. Let me move forward. But I'm trying to move on. I don't want to be too long, but I do have a story also that was in the in the in the, in the scriptures that was a parable. Uh, what you, that uh, that uh, the Lord was trying to teach his disciples how to live life and how to deal with the resources in life and go to the next level and and take it at a different perspective. Sometimes when we're saved and uh, God wants us to do something miraculous and then it doesn't work out we sometimes we give up and we feel like well we don't have the money we don't have the resources nobody's here to help and then you just give up and God just want to kind of show us a parable of what happened to this rich man that had a manager that handled his transactions as well but he was found corrupt and he had to end up firing this crooked man instead of the crooked man giving up yeah, he was dishonest, but he wasn't stupid. He was a white collar worker uh, because the Bible kind of describes what type of man he was. He said he wasn't the type of man to dig dig holes, I mean to dig, uh, dig holes in the ground or to get out on the street and beg. He wasn't that type of man. He was a very intelligent man and he wanted the lifestyle that he continued to have. And now that he was, was fired, he goes out and he, he goes to all the masters. Uh, he goes to some of the master's customers and start asking them how much did they owe the master. And so they start telling him how much he owes. So he, he decided to uh, make up a scheme in order to get those people connected and he could start making money of his own and he wouldn't have to go back to work with the man that had fired him. And in the end, it actually worked. The man be, began to have more money than he thought he, he would have gotten as early as he did, but he didn't give up, he didn't stop. So what my surprise about this whole thing is, in the message translation, it, it, I'm going to read it to you. It says, now there was a surprise that the master praised the crooked ma uh, manager. Why did he praise him? Because he knew how to look after himself. Streetwise people are smarter in this regard than law-abiding citizens. They are on a constant, listen to this, they are on a constant alert looking for, for somebody to help them to survive. They have greater wit 
And so I want you to stop. I'm going to stop right there to kind of explain that to you a little bit, what the Bible is trying to tell us. What the Bible is trying to tell us, although you're saved and you're waiting on God, you don't just give up and say, I'm waiting on God and doing absolutely nothing and forget about survival skills. You got to build up some survival skills. Just because you saved, you shouldn't be so humble and, and feel like I'm not going to fight for it. I'm just going to let it go. If that's the way they want it, that's just it. No, you got to fight for what you know God is giving you. And if you lost your job, don't give up and say, well, I'm just going to get unemployment. I, I, don't, I, don't, I can't find another job. I'm too old. I'm not educated. No, 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 no. You got to fight or look for other ways like this man did. This was crooked man that, that he was. The Bible said he was crooked, you know, but he went out and found out a way to make money because he was gifted at that. And he ended up making more money. And he, although he was wicked, they weren't praising him. The master wasn't praising him on his wickedness. He was praising him because he said, this man was smart enough. He had the skills and the survival skills and the wit and enough not to give up, but to go do what he already was doing. And he started another business just like that. So I want you to be that way as well. Don't give up. You know, be like those that are in the world that may have the wit and everything. You do it in a godly way, but you don't give up because God wants you to connect sometimes, even with people that are not saved. Uh-oh, Bible says that too. Go research. He says sometimes we need to connect with people that are not saved because they are the ones that have the money. And if they like you, you ain't got to be their best friends, but if you are their acquaintances or you work with them and you connect with them, and if you need some, something and you lose your job or your home, if they got the money, you go to them. A lot of times it's people that you associate with yourselves are on the same level that you are, and they may not, they be making the same salary you make, and they can't afford to give you any money. They can't afford to give you $100,000 to, uh, to refinance your house or whatever you need. So, but, so don't be afraid to connect with those that are not saved. Hello? Yeah, I said it. It's the truth. It's in Scripture. Look for it for yourself. And it's okay because when you, it's going to be times in your life you're going to have some hard times. And you may not can go to your friends, but you can go to those that you learned, that you have learned to fellowship with. And as far as uh, people that you are acquainted with or working with, that you can go and ask them for help and they can help you. So be wise and learn how to do that. You know, be smart and don't worry about what other people think. Just try to be a good, wholesome relationships, whether they're safe folk, whether they're not saved folk. Not saying you got to go to clubs with them, hang out with them, but be professional. If they're on your job and they're professional, you be on your job, you be professional and befriend them because you never know who God brings in your life that you're going to need sometime. And it might not be your brother and sister that's sitting next to you. All right. In 1 Samuel 18 and 14, the Bible says closer than a brother. What does it mean to be closer than a brother or closer than a friend? The Bible says, by the time David had finished reporting to Saul, Jonathan was deeply impressed with David, and he immediately bond with him, and they became, he became loyal to David. He was like a brother that's, or a friend that stick is closer than a brother. You know the story of, of David and, and Jonathan. Jonathan loved him so much, the Bible says, that they made a covenant with each other, and he formalized that by giving him gifts, giving David gifts and, and with robes and weapons so he could go out and fight. When you have a friend that sticks closer than a brother, it's like a soul tie. A soul ties are affectionate bondings between two or more persons with the goal to work for each other's welfare and protection. It is so deep that each party in the relationships is naturally pulled by a force to remain loyal, never complaining, and to protect the interest of the other party. Now I have seven ways that you can become a friend and stay and stay there and build wholesome relationships. Number one, take action, support each other, share with each other, share with each other. Think about what you know about your friends and spring forth. In other words, if they need something, don't wait and say, do you want me to help you? You know they need help, help them. Number two, give them an encouraging word. You know, death lies, you know, in the power of the tongue. So speak out what you feel. Don't say they know I love them. Speak out. They may need a word from you on a heavy day that they're feeling heavy in their spirit. Number three, be honest and authentic. Number four, 
Be present in the moment. When somebody's talking to you, don't be looking at the phone and they're talking to you. Be in the moment. Be in the presence with your friends. Give them quality time and be on time. And if they ask you to come somewhere or be somewhere at a certain time, time is valuable. Communicate. Number six, communicate a key, uh, uh, giving them a, your full attention by communicating them and making them think that they're the key person in your life at that moment. When I say, you know, be there in the moment, let them know that. Look them in the eye. Speak to them, not be for real. Don't fake it. Do what's in your heart. If you love them, you would do that. It would be no problem with that. And celebrate their accomplishments, even when you're feeling jealous. Uh huh. Sometimes you may be jealous of your friends because they seem like they're getting more ahead than you are. But ex- ex- uh, uh, celebrate them and enjoy a life of friendship with them. Be there when they need you. Number eight, friendships are a gift from God and give you and then also when you have them when you when they offend you love covers a multitude of sins so sometimes friends we're going to fall out with our friends that we really love but if they stick a closer than a brother or sister then you'll forgive them and you'll move forward so that's all I have right now the importance of friendship continue to build relationships outside of your family and those that are common, what I mean by common, those that you know on a day-to-day basis because there's so many people out there that God wants you to connect with. They want to hear your voice. So stay encouraged. We love you. Have a blessed day. And remember, the power of relationships can take you to the next level. God bless you. I am serving two positions in this panelist. As the moderator, as well as one of the presenters. And I have been given the subject of a divine imprint of a called out life. And as as a scripture reference, I want us to look at 1 Corinthians, Paul's first epistle to the church of Corinth, chapter six, verse 19. Hear the word of the Lord. Do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit who is in you, whom you have from God, and you are not of your own. A divine imprint of a called out life is a divine appointment, a God-given assignment, an anointing, a plan and purpose from God for your life. The word imprint, as noted by the Webster's Dictionary online, it is a mark, an engravement on a surface or the body. However, I would like to broach not only a mark or engravement on the body, but an imprint on the consciousness of the mind. Russell Stannard, an American physicist, in his book entitled Finding God in the Human Mind, says for those who think the evidence for God is found only in the world around us, says that we are starting in the wrong place. Instead, we must begin by looking inside ourselves into the inner recesses of our own consciousness where the ultimate source, which is God, has left an imprint. I have an affinity with this philosophical insight. And this is my revelation that has been imparted to me. I am unable to recall a time when I did not know about Jesus the Christ. My mind, my spirit, my soul, My body was imprinted by a divine calling. I recall going into the forest behind our home in Georgia at the early age of 11, between 11 and 12, and I would be in solitude there talking to God about everything. Now, my parents never told me to go to the forest and be alone with God. 
I was drawn to a place where I could bask in the presence of God and talk to God about everything. The imprint of the who-ness of God was engraved into my consciousness long before the time in the forest, long before my birth. I was imprinted by my mother who carried me in her womb. While my mother was carrying me in, in her womb, I was being groomed for such a time as this. While in her womb, I listened to her reading the Bible. I, I listened to her singing songs of praise. I was with her when she daily walked with God and talked to God. I listened to the prayers at the prayer meetings that my mother attended. I listened to my mother praying. I listened to my father as he prayed next to her. I listened to the many people at all the churches where my mother attended while she was carrying me in her womb. All of this imprinted in my consciousness long before I was born. It's, it is explained in Jeremiah chapter one, verse one. The imprint of God was established before we were born. Jeremiah tells us in chapter one and verse one, says the Lord of Israel, before I formed you in your mother's womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I appointed you as a prophet to the nation. Now, that's what he said to Jeremiah. But not only does God say that to Jeremiah, he says it to us. Long before when you were born, you were set apart for such a time as this. You were set apart for such a time as this. God's imprint was all over you even before you were conceived in the womb. We can see it all through the biblical text, the appointments, the assignments, the purpose and plan for the lives of God's people. Let's take a look. Ruth, she was assigned and appointed to go before the king to save her people. David as king, slayer of Goliath the giant and leader made real words of intimacy with God so profound in the Psalms. Moses, as a leader of the Israelites, out of bondage, purpose appointed, assigned. Deborah, as judge, helped to lead an army against their enemies. Martha, who bore John the Baptist. Mary, who gave birth to Jesus the Christ. And the ultimate assignment, Jesus, the Christ, went to the cross, crucified, died, buried, rose again in resurrection so that we may have eternal life, our sins to be forgiven. Listen, beloved, get this. Paul in his first letter to the church of commerce says it all. Do you know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? who is in you, whom you have been given this by God. You belong to God. We are God's creation. God's signature is on us. God's imprint is on his masterpieces, you and I. God has an imprint on us just as a great painter signs his paintings. God imprints our plan and purpose an assignment on us. He sets us apart. God has an imprint on us. First John, fourth chapter, four verse says to us, you belong to God. You are children of God and you have overcome the world because he who is in you is greater than he in the world. Beloved, our body, mind, soul, and spirit belong to God. You have a spiritual DNA. You have an imprint from God, one you gave 
when you gave your life to Jesus of Christ and you have a personal relationship, baptized in the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus. It tells you there again in Mark. It says, as a believer, you've been set apart. But to show your imprint, to show that you are a part, a follower of Christ, a part of the body of Christ, the family of God. Number one, you are able to cast out demons, devils. Two, you shall speak with new tongues. You shall take up serpents. For if you drink any deadly thing, it shall not hurt you. Five, you shall lay hands on the sick and they shall recover. Jesus has given all of us an assignment. Even before we were conceived and we dwelled in the womb of our mothers. God was grooming you for such a time as this. God was setting you up how to serve him and give him glory with your life. You beloved brothers and sisters, teens and tots, you have an imprint, an engravement in your body, mind, and spirit. And so you have a spiritual DNA and God has given you a planned purpose for your life to give him glory. To help make disciples for Jesus Christ. I admonish you right now to trust God. Put your life in the Lord's hand and let God show you your imprint. That you will give him glory with your life. <clears throat> that you will know your purpose and your plan. In the name of Jesus the Christ. Let us pray. Oh, God, we thank you for an opportunity where we realize that we have an imprint, a divine imprint for a called out life. And even before our day of birth, even before we were conceived, God knew us and he formed us and he set us apart and signed our heart, mind, body, and soul with an imprint from God. In Jesus the Christ, we pray, amen. Our next panelist is Elder Terrence Trapp. He is the grandson of the late district elder, David Evans, who was pastor of St. James Temple, Hines Chapel of Andrews, South Carolina. Elder Trapp relocated to Charleston, South Carolina in 2010 from Winchester, New York. And in February 2013, he and his beloved wife, Georgia, organized the Synergy Temple Church in North Charleston, South Carolina. And to their union, they have three sons and one daughter. Our presenter, again, Elder Terrence Tramp. God bless you and may the Lord smile upon you. Um, we honor the Lord tonight uh, for being a part of this wonderful, wonderful panel discussion. Um, we thank the Lord for life. Thank him for health and strength. Thank him for um, just keeping us through so many different uh, uh, situations. He still kept and blessed us. And we're just so grateful to be a part of such a tremendous uh, panel discussion. We honor the Lord today. We honor our diocesan bishop, uh, Bishop Marion E. Wright Sr. for his leadership and his guidance and his vision. We thank the Lord for our chairman, Suffolk Bishop Maxie Dobson. Uh, we thank the Lord for our moderator, uh, Dr. Gwen Brown Felder. And we thank the Lord for our panelists, guests that have been part of this discussion. We honor them. We praise God for them. Uh, and we're just grateful to be a part of such a dynamic, um, uh, such a dynamic discussion. On tonight, I have the privilege to discuss 
the advantages of the righteous. What a topic, what a topic. And I, I want you to know, um, my brothers and sisters, it, it pays to be righteous and it pays to be a believer. And to be righteous, you have to be a believer. And, and, and I want you to know it pays. Sometimes it doesn't always feel good. It doesn't always look good. But believe me when I tell you, it pays to be a believer and it pays to walk in righteousness. And um, there are some blessings that come with being righteous. And we just want to take a little bit of time and just kind of highlight the blessings that come and the advantages that come for the righteous. Um, so we want to look into some scriptures that we have um, been given. And there are two legs of scriptures that we, we have been provided with. One of those legs of scripture is Genesis chapter number 18, verse 27 to 32. And the second leg is First Peter uh, chapter number three and verse 12. Now, I, I really would like to add two other legs to the two legs of scripture we have. That way we have four legs and we can build a very strong table uh, for this discussion. So the other two legs of scripture I'd like to add is John chapter number 15, the gospel of John, that is chapter number 15, uh, verse 13 through 15. And the last leg is Psalms, 68 Psalms, and the 19th verse. Now, um, righteousness is when the, the, the definition of it is more to be morally right or justifiable. But um, uh, when we talk about righteousness, we cannot be righteous by ourselves. Righteousness comes from work that we could never do and had nothing to do with. Righteousness comes from the work of our Lord Jesus Christ on the cross. It was through his atoning death. It was through his sacrifice where righteousness has now been credited to us. And I think that's an important thing for us to consider because when, uh, when we make the mistake that it was something that we did that caused us to be in the place where we are, uh, we're, we are on a road to danger because righteousness is, had nothing to do with nothing that you or I could have done. And I think that's the beauty of it because if, to be honest, there is nothing that I could have done to get me out of the mess that I was in. There is nothing that you could do or could have done to get you out of the mess that you were in because the righteousness that you needed could only come through Jesus Christ. He was the one, he was sinless. He put himself in a position to be crucified. His life was laid down and he rose from the grave. Through that work, he has paid off the debt of sin, the punishment for sin. He has now made an atonement for you and me. Hallelujah. And in doing so, he now gives us the credit of righteousness. Here's the kicker. The righteousness is only for those that believe. And what is it that you believe? It has to be the word of God. The apostle Paul says, for I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believes. So this, this, this righteousness that is, that, can, that, that is given to us through the work of the Lord Jesus Christ is only for those that believe. So that's why, my friends, it pays to be a believer. It pays to be a believer because believers um, walk in righteousness because they believe that the righteousness of God has been given to us through the work of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the only way. That is the only way. But you have to believe the story. And the story is that for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever shall believe in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, our first scripture in Genesis chapter 18, I'm just going to pick up one verse from each one of these scriptures, and we're going to kind of just build the cake from there, if you will. 
in Genesis chapter 18, verse number, let's take a look at verse number 28. Verse 28, and it says, Peradventure there shall lack five of the 50 righteous. Will thou destroy all the city for lack of five? And he said, if I find there 40 and five, I will not destroy it. This particular scripture deals with um, Abraham. Abraham, who we know is the father of faith. But something else we uh, know about Abraham, Abraham was the one with that God imputed righteousness to. Because the Bible says that Abraham believed God and it was credited or imputed to him for righteousness. Abraham heard the voice of the Lord. God told him where to go. Abraham got up and he went. He believed God and God gave, counted him as righteousness. So it's the believing that makes the difference and what it is what is the fundamentals of a true relationship. And so God was able to bless Abraham because Abraham believed God. If you want God to bless you, you have to believe God and God will bless you and God will cultivate a relationship with you because the righteous have a relationship with God. In the scripture, Abraham is having a conversation with the Lord. God is on the verge of destroying Sodom and Gomorrah. While this is about to take place, God begins to discuss what he is about to do. And he says, well, should I even, should I let Abraham in on what it is I'm going to do? Um, seeing that he is going to be a father of many nations. And as God is contemplating what he's going to do, Abraham is hearing the whole story. And Abraham begins to talk uh, on behalf of those that may uh, potentially uh, die because of the circumstance in Sodom and Gomorrah. Now, um, this is a very critical verse of scripture. And this is what really brings home the point of the advantages of the righteous. Now, there's a number of advantages that come with being righteous, but I just want to talk about one for tonight. And um, the, the one advantage that I really want to hone in on and really speak from is the advantage of access. The advantage of access. Now, access is... It means permission, liberty, or ability to enter, approach, or pass to and from a place, or approach or communicate with a person or a thing. It goes on to say that access is freedom or ability to obtain or make use of something. Access. The advantage of access. Abraham was righteous, declared by God righteous. So because Abraham had a relationship with God, the Bible says that he used access. Access to do what? Access to intercede. Genesis 18, verse 27 through 32, gives us a sneak peek at what access can do, not just for you, but for others. Do you not know that if you have the faith of a mustard seed, if you have a relationship with God, if you are the righteous of God, you have access to intercede on someone else's behalf. Sister, brother, mother, daughter, friend, co-worker, enemy, you, my friend, have access to their deliverance. You have access to them coming out. You know there are people in your circle that you have access to get them healing? My God, because God has, has invested in the relationship he has with you. See, with a relationship, there must be investment. And when you invest, you can't invest without investing a piece of you. When God invests in a relationship with you, he invests a piece of himself with you. And that's why when we have an when we invest in God, we have to invest all of ours, everything that we have in us. We must invest it. We put all we got in in God, and so even with friendships, 
with marriages. You invest a piece of you. That's why it's very important to, to be very careful where and what and with whom we invest because we're putting in a piece of ourselves. Now, let's take a look at a couple of other scriptures. The second scripture is 1 Peter chapter 3. Let, let's, take, let's take a quick ride over there to 1 Peter chapter number 3. And I want to look at verse number 12. The scripture says, For the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, and his ears are open unto their prayers. But the face of the Lord is against them that do evil. Now, if you notice here, Peter begins to talk about how God's eyes are over the righteous. He's watching the righteous. He's looking out for the righteous. So um, where does access come here? The access is, the Bible says that God's ear is open to the cries or the prayers of the righteous. So here, Abraham has access to God by petitioning on behalf of those that are in Sodom and Gomorrah. He's interceding on behalf of for someone that can't do it for themselves. And because of the relationship, the Bible lets us know that Abraham has access to the ears of God. Hallelujah. Think, think that's a critical piece, my brothers and sisters, because it's twofold. Because you're righteous, the advantage of the righteous is access. You have access to God's ears with your mouth. And not only that, you have access to God's mouth with your ears. If you have a relationship with God, God will give you access to hear what he's saying. You, you have now have access to what comes out of the mouth of God through the ears of the believer. We, have, we, we underestimate just how powerful the relationship and the power of access is with a walk with God. It is so powerful. And many times we live beneath our means, but we have a great, we have a vast amount of power through the access for, from a relationship with God. Now, these two scriptures together show how you can have God's ear, you can get God's attention, and you can also intercede on behalf of someone else. That's access um, used in its proper, proper way. Now, let's take a look at these other two scriptures, which just kind of helped push this um, along just a little bit further. First, uh, John chapter 15. Take a look what John chapter 15 says. Jesus talks to the disciples. And let's just look at verse 15. It just says, henceforth, I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth. But I have called you friends for all things that I have heard of my father, I've made known to you. Uh, let me go a little bit further. Verse 16, you have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you that you should go and bring forth fruit, that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever you ask of the Father in my name, he may give it to you. Now, we see Abraham's access in Genesis chapter 18. Now, we also see the disciples' access because Jesus calls them friends, and he gives the disciples access. He gives, he gives the disciples access what does he give them access to? First thing he gives them access to is revelation. Yes, he does. He says, because you're my friends, because a servant doesn't know what the master is doing. But I, I, have, I have shown you what I'm doing. I've allowed you to, to be in the circle to hear what it is I'm doing. Oh, when you are a friend of God, God will have you see his program. God will show you what he's doing. And sometimes we're in a situation where no one knows what's going on but you. Because you have a relationship with God, God will not cause you to be hit off guard. He'll always let you in on the inside scoop because of the advantage of the righteous relationship you have with God. Uh, the believer should never be caught off guard because you have an inside scoop with the Lord Jesus Christ. And then he says, uh, what did he says? I've chosen you that whatever you ask in my name, I'll do it for you. 
So not only do the disciples have access, but they have access to what? They have access to the power that produces results. He says, not only will I give you power through my name, when you use my name, I'm going to do it. In other words, when you use my name, I'm going to give you access to results. I'm going to give you access to answers. I'm going to give you access to victory because you know my name and your friends of mine. Now, if I were to use a subtopic, let's go to Psalm 68, verse 19. And this is our last leg for the table. 68, verse 19 says, Blessed be the Lord who daily loadeth us with benefits, even the God of our salvation. Um, blessed be the God that gives, loadeth us with benefits. If I were to use a subtopic to the advantage of the righteous, I would have to use friends with benefits. Not only are you a friend of God, but you get the benefits of the access with God. That way, you know, you can have friendships. You ever had a friendship with someone, but it seems like it's always one-sided. It seems like it, there's never any reciprocation in the relationship. Well, well, it's not like that with the Lord Jesus Christ. He says, when he says you're a friend, you're a friend, and he's going to give you access to him that whatever you need, he will make it so you can get what you need. And so the disciples and Abraham both give us examples of the power of relationship, the power of relationship of the righteous. And one of the advantages is one of the most, if not the most important factor of an advantage is access. My brothers and sisters, don't, don't waste your access. Don't waste your access. It is too important. It's too powerful. It's too significant, not only to your life, but to the lives of people that are waiting on you to pray for them. Do you not know the Bible says in the book of James, for the effectual fervent prayer of the righteous availeth much. Jesus said it is through his name. That's why the Bible says the name of the Lord is a strong tower and the righteous runneth therein and they are safe. It's the access to safety. It's access to power. It's access to not just in this world, but in the world to come. Jesus told the disciples there's going to come a time where he's going to say, well done, my good and faithful servant. Here's your access. Enter in my joy. You've been faithful over a few things. I'll make you ruler over many. My brothers and sisters, access is one of the most powerful commodities that the believer possesses. And I encourage you all. Don't waste your access. Don't, don't give your access to anybody, but cherish the access that God has given you because you're a friend. And with friendship comes benefits, benefits like no other. Well, may the Lord bless you. May the Lord encourage you. May the Lord empower you to walk in access, live in access, speak access, and you shall have access. God bless you. In Jesus' name. Wow. What an outstanding panel that we had today. Just want to thank Dr. Connie Green for her excellent presentation on friendship, closer than a brother, and elder, elder Terrence Trapp for his distinguished advantages of righteousness. What a wonderful time we've had. We thank you for continuing to tune in with us at the November Council of the 58th Episcopal District of the Pentecostal Assemblies of the World Incorporated. Again, thank you for listening and watching and continue with us. Stay with us as we continue for our November Council. Praise the Lord, everybody. Thank you so much for tuning in to another virtual council session for the North Carolina State Council. I know you've been enjoying all the awesome ministry and word 
that's been going forth. And now is the time of our virtual council where we want everyone to be involved uh, as we continue to get through this unusual season. We need your support. And so to help us out on today, you have three options to give to the council. The first option is to go to the council website, www.ncstatecouncil.com. At the top of the page, you'll see an option for online giving, and then you can click the yellow donate button. You can also get via Cash App at dollar sign NCSC580. And finally, you may give by phone by calling 910-864-2881. We thank you in advance for your liberal giving, and we hope you continue enjoying this virtual council setting. God bless you.